Hey, it's Mark Pinoski, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And on this week's roundtable, we're missing a few people, but the usual suspects are here. We've got Dude Buddy, the Nightcap OG, Scott Boston. Scott, how are you? Great, Mark. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's great to see you sober. And uh, because if you're not listening to Nightcap, a, an inebriated Scott Bossman talking about land investing with uh, the Zen master, Mike Zeno. It's just so great. So join the thousands at night. Is it, was it, what night is it? Wednesday nights? Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday nights, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. 10 p.m. Eastern. Check out the, uh, the Facebook group and join on there. Also streams live on YouTube. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? I'm good. It's good to see you, as always. So excited for this week's tip of the week. Um, we got, I love it when you call me Big Papa, Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are you doing? I'm great. Happy to be on the podcast today. Good to see you. Very good to see you. It looks like you've lost about five pounds post-Tampa. Yeah, it was, uh, Scott lived, uh, he pulled out all the stops again, Forrest, and you know, no longer, I'm going to say it publicly here, no longer is Scott, or is the word Panera Bread supposed to be associated with Scott Todd? I'm just going to publicly right. come out and say it. And I'm not, I'm not on Team Scott by any means. I'm just saying that is a bad, bad nickname, and he does not deserve it. This guy knows how to eat, man. You know what? I'm, I, I, I'm going to have to just really You're going to have to agree. You have echo, to agree. echo those sentiments, and um, I will be working in the 2020 apology tour for making any any negative remark about Scott and his tastes in any possible way. I've already contacted yeah. his family, his friends. Um, I have actually written a letter to Panera Bread as well and their corporate team, and saying that in no way is Scott Todd associated with them. And uh, it was simply a matter of just taking a handful of sand and calling it the desert. It was just, it's just wrong, just wrong. Which leads us to Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist, your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com, forward slash land geek, learn anything but anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how's it feel to be the foodie of the land geek community? Yeah, well, you know, Mark, it's uh, it's funny because I clearly remember you telling me on a podcast or accusing me of having a simple palate. And I'm like, that's so wrong, man. That's like, you don't even really know me. You think you know me. You're making uh, assumptions about me. And it was to my delight to take you to this one restaurant for like the, I think you said, Scott, this is my death row meal. I think that's what those were your words. It, it could have been the death row meal. Yeah. 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 So it definitely, you know, yeah. I, it was my mic drop moment. I loved it. And, uh, you know, game on. I look forward to, uh, to, to go into the next boot camp in like your hometown and eating at the uh, hotel that we're working at that night. So I'm not even going to touch that because we have a really good topic to discuss this week. And it's, it came up in our newest program, and if you just graduated from coaching, the Land Geek boardroom was really, really a phenomenal experience. And Scott, do you want to just kind of give everybody a little taste of the boardroom? Yeah, so basically imagine, like, you know, you're, you're this entrepreneur, you're, you're starting your land investing business, and you, you've gone through coaching, you've worked with your coach and everything, uh, you've, you're building the business, and then all of a sudden, you're, you know, your coaching's coming to an end, and it's like, okay, well, what next, right? Like, cause you, you have that person that's overlooking your business with you and, and helping to guide you and to help you to scale the business the way that you want to. And then as you come to the end of coaching, well, it's like, okay, well, what's next? And so this is where the land geek boardroom comes in. And basically what happens in the boardroom is we bring in together five people, five businesses, if you will, five other land investors, who are basically at the exact same spot that you are, are very close to it. Okay. Like it's, you, you're near each other. You're, you're similar, your peers. We bring you into the boardroom and this boardroom whole process is going to push you. First of all, 
We're going to ask you to, to build a presentation on your business, a predefined presentation. We're going to ask you to provide data about your business so that your peers can look at your business with you to be able to guide you and to help you with some of your biggest challenges or to celebrate your successes. So this, this presentation is pretty, pretty in depth, right? I think some people who went to this first boardroom basically told us that they felt like, you know, it was my words exact. I'm using my words, but it's how they, they felt is that like they, they had to go to the doctor and they had to remove their clothes, right? Like it's that type of, you're seeing everything. You're seeing the good, the bad, the ugly of the business. You're seeing everything. And ultimately uh, it's good. It's good to help you move the needle forward because it it builds the foundation or the baseline of where you are today. And during this boardroom process, you're presenting in a, on a certain topic and then the, the room takes over and starts to ask you questions or to help guide you or to give you suggestions or to help you overcome some of the challenges that you're, you're having. And ultimately what you have in that boardroom is really the, the ultimate accountability partner because now you have a board of advisors there that will sustain with you as you guys go through your next year. And that's kind of a, a, a quick overview of the Land Geek boardroom. Yeah, no, it, it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal to see them all bond as well, because now as the year goes on, they're going to meet again at the nine month mark. And, but then they're going to have these mastermind calls um, every month, holding each other accountable, working on, you know, saying one issue that came out of that, that weekend. And um, it's just, it, it's really, there's no other way to sort of explain it unless you've been on any kind of mastermind group where having just that, that person that you can trust, that you know is looking out for your best interests, seeing it through their eyes, your business, and saying it in a way that you might be able to hear better than if your coach says it, is, is so impactful. Because even just that one little tweak can make the big, big difference in your business. And um, I'm, I'm really, really pumped about it. And uh, I think for all our coaching clients that are, coming through and, and getting ready to uh, be done with their program. It's, it's, it's so comforting to know that there's something afterwards that will, you know, hold them accountable. They won't be lonely with any issues with the business and having that board of directors that really cares about their business as much as they are, because it's, it's relatable. It's not like, you know, there's other programs where you have entrepreneurs from all over the country, you know, doing a million plus in revenue, but they're in different industries. And so sometimes they can't even relate, you know, product guy can't relate to a service guy, but when you're all in the same business doing the same things and can say, this was my best performing ad. This was the one that didn't perform and sharing that it's, it's so powerful. So I'm really excited about it. If you are interested in learning more, um, and your coaching client or even somebody that might be coming out of flight school and, and thinks that uh, I'm crushing it and I might be ready for the boardroom some, soon, you know, just schedule a call to learn more. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training, which leads us to what we learned in the boardroom as a discussion topic was websites. Do you need a website for your land investing business? Eric Peterson, what do you think? Well, uh, first I have a confession to make. So when I started land investing websites and the whole idea of creating a brand, all those things were super important to me. My background was in graphic design. So I invested way too much time creating a logo, creating a website and, and building this, this, fancy website essentially. And, um, you know, I've had it ever since. Um, I, when I look back at it, I know that I spent time I shouldn't have at that point in my business. Um, and you know, I, I like having a website, but it's not required. Um, I've had students who have gone their entire coaching period and never had a website, but continue to sell land on a regular basis. So, it's definitely not a requirement, but I think that um, there are some benefits to it. Um, 
And those would be number one, it makes you look a little bit more legitimate. Um, number two, it might give you a place to um, kind of host some content in terms of talking about your company and how you work and things like that. Now you could do that on YouTube, but um, you know, it might have a little more legitimacy if it's, you know, kind of built into your website. Um, of course you could list your properties there. Um, of course you might sell some property there um, though. It's, it's pretty unlikely. Um, it will happen from time to time. Um, so, you know, I think that it's, it's certainly not something that a new investor should spend much time on. Um, as you progress in the business, it might be worthwhile to, to build one out and, and have it out there for your customers to see and, and be able to just kind of see that you're a serious company and, and you're, you, you know, you represent yourself well. When's the last time someone went on your website and bought a piece of property without you having to say a word to them? Um, that direct scenario, it's, it's been a while. Uh, that happens very rarely. However, um, I will get a lead from time to time that comes directly off my website and they might not buy right away, um, but they might buy soon. So uh, actually just yesterday I had a sale where the lead came from my website. It happens maybe every couple of months. You know, it's, it's not a lead source I rely on, but it does happen. All right, Scott Bossman, what do you think? Are you gonna play devil's advocate? <laughs> sure, well, I think, you know, Eric, Eric touched on it. I think uh, it's absolutely not necessary, especially for a beginner getting into this. There are so many other things to work on in this business when you're first starting out. Uh, the most important thing is mailing and marketing. We say it all the time. So I think that's where your energy needs to be focused when you're first starting this. Uh, coming up with your system for mailing, coming up with your system for due diligence, coming up with your system for marketing. And I think a website uh, should maybe come later. There are so many free tools that you can utilize. You know, you can create a, a PDF uh, property report quite easily and store it in a Google Drive and send all of your leads there. Um, you know, I, I would say the first six months of my business, I did not have a website. Uh, and I sold, I don't know, probably 15 properties, something like that. Uh, got my website up and running very slowly. I'm not a graphic designer. I am not a tech guy, but I put it together myself, which was kind of a, a source of pride for me. Like, and it's not the best website in the world, but to know that I did that, I'm like, wow, that's, I never thought I'd do that. So uh, I do think it helps um, later on in the business with uh, legitimacy. I think it helps with sending people uh, to your site so they can see your inventory. Although I, I do find that uh, when I have too much inventory on my website, sometimes people get uh, distracted. So I try to keep it. I, I may have more inventory in the wings, but I maybe not, maybe not publishing them all on the website. So uh, I, I think there are good and bad things. But to answer, I think uh, simply you do not need it to start. Uh, we have people making multiple thousands of dollars a month passive income without a website. And that speaks to the fact that you just don't need one uh, necessarily. Although I think, I think it does help with uh, some, some aspects. Okay. All right. Well, should we talk to the irascible Tate Litchfield, what he, what he feels about the, uh, the website? Yeah. I mean, this is a good topic. I think a lot of people get really hung up on it. I would argue that a website doesn't necessarily make you direct money. I think if you're going to put money towards something at first focus on getting more ads posted on Facebook or Craigslist or dealing with your follow up better. I would say focus more on your buyers list, right? Rather than a website, because those are people who have raised their hand at some point and said, I'm interested in what you're selling. So do I think a website's a good thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, we don't ever update our website, but uh, hey, you know, there, I know there's people out there who really care about that and it's a, it's a point of pride for them. To me, 
it really doesn't serve a whole lot of purpose. Now, I know that there's some critics out there who could say, well, if I was driving more traffic to your web, my website, I could get more leads. And yeah, they're probably right. Um, the problem with that is I'm not an expert when it comes to SEO. I'm not an expert at that stuff. And I am an expert at generating leads off third-party platforms. So I prefer to put all my time and energy into that because that's where I see the most results. And I think that's what it comes down to. Where do you see the most traffic coming from? If it's your website, we'll go ahead and dump a ton of money into it, but it doesn't have to be fancy. Some of the most productive land investors in the world that I know personally, looks like their websites are from 1997 and they haven't been updated since then. And these guys are selling one property a day. So there's no reason to think that a website is a barrier for entry. I have a good friend in the business who's making almost 20 grand a month and he doesn't have a website at all. And it's never once prevented him from getting a sale. So it's just, I think it, it's just a matter of personal preference. Some people feel like they have to have that to look legitimate. He would argue that maintaining a website is an extra headache and he doesn't have to deal with it. And look at his passive income has him retired from his day job. So he's winning in my opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. I thought it was a good point that you brought up, which is, you know, do you really want to spend the money trying to crack Google or Facebook ads in cold traffic to a website where you could for free use an already, you know, trusted platform and start building up your buyers list that way, which costs you nothing. And, you know, I've been doing this 20 years. I know one guy really that spends a lot, maybe two guys that spend a lot on, on paid traffic to their website. And, I guarantee when they first started, they were not, that's not how they started. It was, it was a part of a scaling strategy where they wanted to get to that next level and they knew the, their numbers well enough. They knew how much they could pay for a lead, how much they could pay for a customer until you know, those numbers, you have no business even thinking about paid traffic, which brings me to the brain, the professor, Scott Todd, Scott Todd, what do you think? So the very first property that I bought uh, when I got in this business was a 40 acre property in Northern Nevada. And I bought it from a, another land seller and I found it on Craigslist. So he was posting on Craigslist and I find it and I, I buy it from him. And I said to him like, Hey, because I didn't tell him like who I was, like, I'm going to, I'm going to put you out of business type of a deal. Right. Well, I, he's still in business. So that, that's just the opportunity. There's no putting somebody out of business. But what's cool is, is that I asked him, I'm like, hey, you got a website? And you know what he did? Is he, he said, no, I don't have a website. He sent me a link to his uh, seller profile on Landwatch. That was his website. Now, this guy buys a lot of land in Northern Nevada. He sells a lot of land in Northern Nevada. He focuses on that Northern Nevada area. To this day, he still does not have a website. He uses his um, seller page on Landwatch as his website. Yep, just go here. Here's all my properties. And I think that that is a testament, right? Like here's a guy that he, he doesn't, he, he's, I don't know how much he's doing, you know, but I can tell you that he, he typically goes after cash deals. Uh, but here's a guy that's selling a boatload of land. He's got some nice properties, some very nice properties right on the interstate. He's not, he's not worrying about it, man. He's not out there worrying about, oh, website, or I need a website. A lot of times that's a crutch. When you see someone that they're like, oh, I need a website, it's a crutch. They, they're, it's a crutch because they don't, they're not doing the stuff that they need to, the mail and the marketing. Scott Bossman talked about that, right? Mail and market, do that. And then you don't need a website, right? Like, cause you, you're generating leads. And if, if you didn't, did need a website, if you, if you felt like you did need a website, well, it's just one more thing. You, oh, I got to put the properties up there and I got to upload them. And okay, if you're looking for a credibility thing, great, create a credibility page or create a landing page for each property that you can send someone to. You can use something like a, a lead pages or uh, some, some landing page creator and every property can have its own, own um, you know, landing page. So you can get more information on that. Use Landmoto, right? Like, you know, send, send the customers to the properties that you have available on Landmoto. You can do that. So essentially, you don't need a website. I think it's, um, 
I think it's a nice to have, it's not a necessity. And I'll tell you what really drives me crazy though, is the, the two websites. When people have the two websites, you know what I'm talking about, Mark? So Scott is trying to bait me and get my heart rate going. I'm not taking the bait. I, uh, I have very you strong have opinions websites, right? about a buying site and a selling site. And the only way that you're going to hear me go on a tirade is if you come to boot camp. The Phoenix boot camp is in six weeks. I saved this tirade just specifically for the people at boot camp. Just go to landgeek.com forward slash boot camp to register. And then you will hear it's about a five to 10 minute tirade about what I think about having two websites, a buying site and a selling site. The argument being, I certainly don't want the people that I'm buying my land from to see how much I'm selling it for to be continued. Good try though, Scott Todd. Very good try. Well, you know, what's fun. What's funny is we, um, I, like we got a request through land, uh, through LG pass the other day. So LG pass, we, we just said, Hey, if you have an idea, put it on here. And someone said, uh, being able to reassign a property in LG pass to another company because they buy from one company and sell it to the other company. And I'm thinking like, I'm just walking through the process, right? Like how that works. And you know, you, you buy the property through one company, which makes no sense because, okay, I, I get it. I get that you want to do that. You buy it from one in one company. Well, then you still have to transfer the deed to the other company, right? Like for it to be legit, you got to still transfer the deed to the other company. And guess what? In most counties where the deeds are online, you can see, oh, this company paid $100 and uh, oh, that company paid $3,500 for it. Guess what? They're still going to figure out what you paid for, right? They're going to they're gonna figure out the, the moving of the paper around. You're not hiding anything. You're just creating more work for yourself. What do you think about that, Mark? Can I bait you with that? So I really have very strong opinions about this. What, what's interesting, though, is that I have the Apple Watch and I can check my heart rate. In this type of topic, I'm, I'm hitting about 180 right now. So, so I don't redline. Um, I really think we should go to Tate, who is, I know, has a very, a very good argument about this. Was getting back to the website. Like, here's the argument, Tate. Okay. Would you eat at a restaurant that didn't have any online reviews? Okay, so this is a tough question. I wouldn't say I'm as much of a foodie as Scott Todd has proven to be. However, I do believe that uh, sometimes you can judge a restaurant if you drive by it by how many people are in the restaurant. So if I drive by a restaurant without looking it up on Yelp and I see a ton of customers in there, I'm thinking, hmm, that looks really, really good. And if there's there wouldn't be people in that restaurant spending money eating the food if it wasn't good quality, right? We ate at a place in Tampa where the line was like three blocks long. And uh, Scott pulled some strings and got us to the front of the land or front of the line. He must have been, you know, he's a frequent flyer there. So, um, and it lived up to its name. But um, when it comes to a website, I think that you can look for other ways to promote yourself. And I don't, I just don't think a website's necessary personally. I think you can get by without it. Is the analogy fair? I do think it's a fair analogy, but I mean, it just depends on what your objectives and your your targeted audience is, right? If personally, I don't want to work with the people necessarily who need 50 forms of identification in order to proceed with the with the the deal, right? I don't want to work with somebody who needs to have a better bureau of, of business rating. I don't want to have to show you my land moto profile. I don't want to have to give you my personal website or my Facebook name and all of that. Like, do you want the land or not? That's kind of how we operate and a website has never helped me close a deal. I think it's given a little bit of security, but I don't think I've ever had anybody say to me, oh, you have a website? Oh, you're trustworthy. Eric Peterson, what do you think? I think, you know, it. I still think that it's, it's not necessary, but I do see advantages to having it. Um, you know, I think 
all the things that we've discussed today are very valid points. Um, you know, focus on your business, mail and market, because those are the most important things. Don't worry about the website. Do it when you have a chance, but it's not going to make or break a sale. Ultimately, it might be a helpful tool along the way, but it's, it's not going to be the difference maker. Yeah. Okay. How about Scott Boston? Scott, hey man, I need to have a website right away because I want to look professional. Uh, no, it's, it's not necessary. Uh, there, there, are all, there are all kinds of ways to come across as professional. First and foremost being just how you communicate with that person. You make a connection with them on the phone. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk on the phone anymore, so send them a video on Facebook Messenger or something like that. Uh, come across as real and authentic, and uh, that's going to do more for you than uh, a website will. And you know what? Uh, there are other ways to, to prove legitimacy. I'll send you a copy of the deed. I'll, I'll show you a screenshot of the, the county website. Uh, all that stuff uh, uh, you're not able to do on my website. So, um, so I think uh, authenticity and legitimacy can come from other, other forms uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, right now, um, Tate, like you could do a Facebook store and you could yeah. have Facebook reviews. I mean, it could all just be on Facebook for free. What do you think of that? And I think that's a really good approach to doing it. And, and the reason I like that is if you say, here's some reviews off my website, what's to say that I didn't hire somebody off Fiverr or Upwork to write me a bunch of reviews? If they're on Facebook, there's some credibility behind it, right? Not just anyone can go leave you a review. I guess anybody could, but the chances of there being some sort of foul play in that are a lot smaller in my opinion. So I think the Facebook store is a great option. Um, you can post your new properties out there, drive people there. They can see positive or negative reviews, depending on what you get. But uh, it's good exposure for sure, and it doesn't cost you anything. That's the other thing. Hosting a website, there's a fee associated with that. There's a fee associated with maintaining a website. And unless you're Eric Peterson and have a background in this, there's a learning curve that goes into it. And Eric spent a ton of time working on his website, and he knew what he was doing. Can you imagine how much time I'd spend on it if since I don't have a background in this, hours. Yeah, if you want to see a beautiful website, go to landopia.com. And, uh, and don't copy it. Just look at it. It's very inspirational. Scott Todd, you know, we're giving Facebook a lot of love, but I could set up just a nice seller profile in Landmodo, and I could show all my listings in Landmodo. What does that cost? Uh, free. Start off. Yeah, I mean, you know, even uh, I could afford that. I think you can afford a little bit more than that. You can afford the platinum plan, man. Four ninety seven a year. Come yeah, on. I could. You, could. you could be a baller here. Speaking well, of look, that platinum that, plan, it's it's a great investment because all I have to do is one deal, and, and my doc my doc fee pays for it. Yeah, Scott, right. I had four leads today off Land Moto. That's nice. Somebody's making a sale this afternoon. That's a good thing. Yeah. I had to do exactly zero work for that either. That's what I love. Well, you had to, someone had to put the property on. Not you, though. Yeah, not me, but somebody did. Somebody that makes very uh, minimal payment, you know, amount of money. It's awesome. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Eric, if you had to start again, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently? Or would you have done anything differently? Um, that's tough because I think, you know, I still have that, that element of, you know, being a graphic designer kind of ingrained into me. I went to school for it. I practiced professionally for, for many years. So to say that I wouldn't do that again, I don't know if I could say that with a hundred percent certainty. I think looking back at myself, I would tell myself, don't waste your time on that do more deals because that's going to help you out. Um, but, you know, if I started today, like I did, you know, back five years ago, I could see myself making the same mistake. Yeah. Tate, if you had a new coaching client, they said, Hey, I want to, you know, spend 1500 bucks on a really nice website and land listing website. What, what would your, how would you guide them? 
You know, some people are bound and determined to do it. And there's nothing that I can say or tell them to sway their opinion. And that's okay. I would say go for it. Just as long as it doesn't uh, cost your growth, your immediate growth, right? If it stunts your ability to get out offers or you're spending all this time building a platform that doesn't necessarily make you money, you can do that as long as you're making sales during other times, right? So don't neglect the basics of the business to focus on a luxury item, I guess. Mail, market, respond to clients, get your deal of the week out. And if you still have time at the end of the day or you want to burn the midnight oil and build a website, go for it. But don't let it consume you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to Eric's point, you don't need to have a beautiful, you know, graphic designer background to make a beautiful website. Like I think, Tate, you even mentioned this too. It kind of like the difference between a Mac and a PC. They sell millions of PCs. So there is no accounting for taste. Yeah, no, it's, it's very good. That's a very, very valid and proper analogy. I think it sums up this podcast very well. Yeah, I think, I think now is a really good time to segue into our tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable. But before we do that, just a quick reminder, today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. If you want to learn how the next 16 weeks can literally change your life, Scott Todd being your Sherpa up the mountain of land investing quickly, safely, and efficiently. Learn more, just go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Get on a call with Scott the nightcap OG, Dude Buddy Bossman, or the Zen Master, Mike Zeno. And what's beautiful about this program is it literally will cost you nothing guaranteed. You will make back your flight school tuition in 180 days or less. Most people do it in just eight weeks, guaranteed, or your money back. It's that simple. Scott Bossman, is that irresistible? Uh, that is irresistible. That's, that's guaranteed success, in my opinion. Yeah, just execute. Show us that you're executing. It's fair enough. We got skin in the game. You got skin in the game. So Eric Peterson, since Mimi's not here, the terrorist hunter, what is the tip of the week? Yeah, so Mimi put me on the spot by not showing up today, but uh, I want you all to know I, I came through. I've got a tip for everybody to to take a look at today. It's called productivity.so. Um I'm a huge fan, um, and it's probably being a Mac user, but I'm a huge fan of using key commands um, within my apps uh, for efficiency, right? Um, I don't hardly ever use those menus up in the upper left corner. Um, it's all key commands. So productivity.so um, is just a kind of a knowledge base of all sorts of kind of tips and tricks about, you know, being more efficient on your computer. Um, you know, how to open a new tab in Safari or Chrome or, you know, open up the, uh, the put the cursor in the URL bar or whatever it might be. Um, you're going to find some key commands that uh, you can learn and utilize uh, to make yourself more efficient on the computer. Wow. You know what you just took me to, by the way? Coco.so. Meet Coco, the app to achieve your goals. Well, that's interesting. When you click the link I gave you? Yeah, it's, it's already on there. Like these same guys created. Uh, okay. It looks pretty cool. Schedule events and to-dos. I'm using do for this, but this is, this is even better looking. I'm going to look at it. And then to give Scott Todd a little love, I'm using subscriptionzero.com whenever they ask me for my Email address, that thing works great. Scott, are you using that? Uh, no. Oh, it's it's fantastic because you get you get one email a week and you get all your subscriptions curated I, in that one email. I use unenroll. Yeah, that's what I use. Unenroll? What is that? Un, unroll dot me. Unroll me. Un, or unroll dot me. Yeah. Is that free? Yeah. Well, how's it different than subscription subscription zero though? I don't know. It's better. How am I solid? It is. Yeah, I've been using it forever. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, whatever. Okay. Well, I do, I, have a, think... I do have a question for Eric though, because he he took the dig at the the whole Mac thing. I do have I do have a point here. 
All right, Eric, do you use Gmail? I do. Okay, do you use the key commands in Gmail? No, because I don't use Gmail itself, like the, the web app. I just, uh, I use a mail client. Well, a few years ago, I switched over to the, uh, to the, to the key commands in Gmail. Mm -hmm. And I do agree, it is much better to use key commands whenever possible. So we agree, but hmm, we'll see. Just Mac users are more likely to use key commands. Well, you know, Mac, we, we have a podcast guest that has clearly defined Mac users as not very analytical either. So <laughs> by the time the listeners hear that, they're going to have forgotten about this podcast. Mark, I need, I need to execute my, um, my uh, apology tour. One of the apology tour uh, things, obviously I get some benefits from having been on the, you being on the apology tour for me. I'd like to take the podcast that we recorded today where the guy clearly indicated that you cannot be a serious, you know, investor if you're using. Oh, you know what? It's got, I, I hate to cut you. I hate to cut you off right there. No, no, no. I just want to thank like the to listeners like and remind them that the only problem. way that we're going to get the quality of roundtable guests like we did today that are clearly Mac users and love it is if you do three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at the .com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit, as well as the latest wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. I have no idea what Scott is talking about, about this podcast guest. Um, but I'm sure, you know, in nine months when it comes out, he'll remember it and we can revisit it then. All right, you guys ready? One, two, three, let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring. All right, Scott, what were you saying? I'm so sorry. Did I cut you off? Yeah, no, no worries. I, I have strings. I will call somebody who's, who knows what they're doing and I will move Omar to the top of the deck. Number one, he'll be out this Thursday before this podcast comes out and then we'll just reference it back. Don't worry. I have, I have strings. Look, he, you know, he did, he did say a few nice things and um, you know, you have to listen to the podcast to hear it. I, In you know, nine months. I, I think we should talk about the airplane Tate in, in Tampa. <laughs> how, how cool was that? Oh, it was really cool. For those of you who don't know, we got to go uh, see Scott Todd's plane in it, in the ultimate man cave, which is his hangar. And it's pretty sweet. Uh, it was cool to be able to walk around and sit in the cockpit, cockpit of a plane and kind of touch a bunch of buttons and flip a bunch of switches. So when Scott gets in his plane tomorrow to take off, he's like, <laughs> what is going on? He's freaking out. So, you know, I left him some surprises in there, but... Uh, no, it was really cool. Yeah, it was really cool. You know, you know it's so funny. It reminds me of uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Remember, do you remember that movie? And uh, the Cameron's dad had a, like this beautiful Ferrari. And he's talking about how his dad cleans it. Like Scott's like cleaning the wings. Like the, 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 the airplane shines like, like no other. It's, it, it's like gorgeous. I mean, I felt like, you know, Scott was treating me truly as a, a millennial and a little kid because I'm out there and I'm touching everything and he's walking behind me basically with a spray bottle and a rag, just like wiping off my fingerprints, like need to remove all evidence of Tate Litchfield, all evidence. And I'm touching lights and buttons and putting my fingers in like the plane and it's cool. I mean, it is, and Scott was there a little bit paranoid, but uh, that thing is clean. It is a nice looking plane and I'm jealous more than anything, just of how big his like man cave is. It's massive. Yeah. But it, I, you're not jealous of the freedom of flight. Yeah. I'm jealous of that. No. And he looked like, like a true aviation expert. We go out to the airfield. It's dark. He turns on the lights. It's like, that was oh, cool. That oh, was really cool. Man. Too. Scott owns the place out there. It's just, it's a quiet little airfield where, uh, you know, basically 
Scott can do whatever he wants and fly his plane. It was, it was really cool. We, you, we could, uh, the, the hangar so big, we could do a boot camp in Tampa in the, at the hangar. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, it'd be a little noisy with the planes and everything, but eh. yeah, I don't know. That was cool. So between the food and the airplane, and just the boardroom, it was it was a tremendous uh, tremendous weekend, yeah, for sure. No doubt. Um. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Eric uh, and Scott Bossman. Sorry you guys did not get the chance to experience the, uh, the beauty that is Tampa. Um, you know, if you're in Tampa, own, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Scott. I have my own Cuban at Panera actually. So oh no, I'm that's gonna, not a real Cuban. Oh no. Good. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. That, 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 that's like saying I, I had my own lobster, red lobster. It was oh. amazing. Oh, you, you cannot even use the word Cuban and Panera in the same sentence. It's, it's, it's fake. It's a fake sandwich. It's all we have here in Wisconsin. That's, that's all I can do. We need to come to Florida. I know. Yeah. We were there in spirit. We were. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, we got to get some Ybor City cigars to show off. That, yeah. that was cool, too. Yeah. Walking through the cigar uh, where they're making cigars and everything. Yeah. Yeah, Tampa's very charming. It, it was it was way better than I thought. Very, very cool, very livable city. Um, just based on the food alone, I could move there. Yeah. Yeah. So I found you a house too, Mark. By the way. Yeah, I found where I'm going to live uh, on that island. Yeah. We're also on that on the on the uh, shore there. Yeah, Bay Shore. Yeah. Bay Shore. Yeah, you can live over there good. on Davis Island. It's all good. Jay, would you move? You know, I like the West Coast. I, I still think the West Coast is the best coast, but there are parts of Florida that I could definitely see myself enjoying. I mean, Tampa has a good climate, although it was a little bit chilly this time of year we were there, which was unseasonable. But it was surprisingly chilly, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. It was, it was a good time, and, you know, I liked it. Definitely liked it. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody.